For the last three decades, Knowledge Center at Bursa has offered technology, resources, services, space and a sense of community. Since 1985, 14,000 titles have been collected with care and attention to high financial literacy standards. In collaboration with a global community of institutions, we ensure access to the world's diverse intellectual and cultural economic heritage as well as fast online services for connectivity to the financial world. Serving the Bursa Malaysia community and beyond, Knowledge Center at Bursa empowers you in your trading and investment analysis research. Financial information at my fingertips. Visit Knowledge Center at Bursa Malaysia today for the collections, for the services, for the sense of community. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in another edition of the Authors Talk series. Today will be the third one in this series. My name is Zian, and this talk is brought to you by Bursa Academy Group Sustainability. I believe today's topic uh, will resonate uh, with uh, many of us because part of the uh, talk content today uh, will be touching on aviation safety and some misconceptions about flying. And who can share with you this fact better if not the pilot himself? So it is my pleasure to introduce you today's speaker, Mr. Lim Kokkin, who is a pilot with Air Asia. Interestingly, he is also an investment advisor. Kokkin is the author of the book, Inside the Cockpit and the Trading Room. He joined Air Asia at the age of 22 and was made captain of the airline at the, uh, at the age of 28. He has started investing at the age of 22. He is 35 and currently lives in KL. Before I hand over the mic to Kokkin, uh, just to let you know if you have any questions for uh, Kokkin, please uh, reserve the questions uh, after his talk. For those who have logged in on uh, via Zoom, you can uh, type in the questions via the chat box. And for the physical audience at the church, uh, just uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and uh, you can ask your questions by speaking to the mic located nearest to you. Okay, without further ado, let us give a warm welcome to Mr. Lim Kokkin to present his talk. Kokkin, over to you. Hi, thank you, Zian. Hi, good afternoon to you. A couple of months ago, I received a phone call from Zian 
the person in charge of Pusa Academy and Pusa Library around 9.30 in the morning. And she said she had discovered about my book from Google and asked if I would be willing to give a speech at Pusa Malaysia. Knowing that it was Pusa Malaysia, I did not hesitate and agree on the spot. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Zian for your uh, all the arrangements. Thank you, Zian. Oh, without further ado, let's get started. Um, I would like to start with a little bit of introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Kok Ken, be five years old, born and raised in Kuala Lumpur. And for further information, still single and available. Okay. If you have uh, any interest, you may leave your message down there. Okay, uh, in year 2020, I, along with my co-author, Oh, uh, so where was I? Yeah, my my co-author, okay, okay, my co-author, C.C. Pong Pui C, Cabin Crew Manager of Asia, we published and wrote a book called Inside the Cockpit and Training Room. I had always wanted to publish a book and MCO 1.0 provided me with the opportunity. So in aviation, we always emphasize about safety. Safety is our first priority, but how we actually enhance and improve aviation safety. Okay, no problem. The question is, how do we enhance aviation safety? The perspective of aircraft manufacturers, such as Airbus and Boeing, the responsibility or job to build more reliable, more advanced and more modern aircraft, with better safety features and more system redundancy. And the perspective of civil aviation authorities, for example, Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia, the responsibility or job to implement more stringent rules and regulations, form supervision and oversight, and to conduct regular audits to ensure that safety and standard are maintained and upheld. And for airline and airport operators, our responsibility is to provide rigorous training to our staff. The key to civil aviation world is training. Having crew are well-trained, pilots are well-trained, aircraft engineers are well-trained, Ground staff, RAM service staff, care service staff, we're all well trained. But there's a group of people heavily involved in flying and yet receive little to no training than the other passengers. If you study aviation history, you notice that a couple of flight incidents or accidents were actually caused by passengers. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Passengers too play a critical role in aviation safety. Uh, I'm sharing the screen now. All right, passengers to play a critical role in aviation safety. Okay, this accident happened in year 2010 in the Republic of Congo. So this property aircraft crashed land in the Republic of Congo. After investigation, it was revealed that one passenger has smuggled a crocodile on board the aircraft. During cruise, yes, it happened all the time. And during cruise, the crocodile was somehow released 
and it caused panic among the passengers. And in response to that, passengers ran to the forward section of the cabin and it caused a significant shift in central gravity. Therefore, the aircraft ultimately lost balance and crashed. So ladies and gentlemen, every time when you board a plane, please do not swap your seats. As we take your wigs and write your seat into account to calculate our takeoff wigs, our takeoff central gravity and takeoff speeds. Significant portion of you swap your seats, it will affect our central gravity. If the central gravity is out of limit, it will be impossible for the aircraft takeoff. Piece number two it happened in year 2019 in Russia. So this Russian plane crashed land on the runway, off the runway, and the two sections of the aircraft caught on a fire. As always, the cabin crew and the captain initiated an emergency evacuation, and the passengers insisted on collecting a few responsible passengers insisted on collecting the hand luggage from the overhead compartment. And it caused a blockage of the escape route to the passengers behind them. And it caused all of them to be burned to death. So ladies and gentlemen, every time when you bought a plane, please do yourself a favor, attention to the safety demo performed by the cabin crew. Number three, Newton battery fire, and this is very often overlooked. We in today's morning world we carry um, smartphones, electronic devices, and they have something in common. They all carry batteries. Battery is very easy to be caught on the fire. And this happened in year 2020, about two years ago. So every time when you bought a plan, just make sure that your electronic devices are switched off for takeoff and landing, and your Bank, for example, must be carried with you on board aircraft. Do not uh, check in your hand luggage. If you have a newly placed electronic devices, please make sure that the battery is connected from the device. Moving on. Okay. Uh, can you test that any my screen is not aligned with the screen here. Yeah, it's from the cloud. I don't see the. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. It's not moving. You're all sitting and I'm looking at it. But it is not bad. It is. Can you see and do it? happened in the year 2010 about the crocodile, and this happened in the year 2019 about the fire. Okay, I apologize for the inconvenience. Newton battery fire. Dangerous goods. Dangerous goods is very critical subject, but yet it is often overlooked. We all carry dangerous goods because we have got dangerous goods in our homes. For example, your detergents, batteries, fire extinguishers, they're all dangerous goods. In aviation, we cannot get rid of tracks completely, but we can try to minimize them. Every time when you bought a plane, please make sure that you read warnings and articles presented to you. Despite the fact that flying is 250,000 times safer than drive a, uh, driving a car, people still feel flying. The cause, the root cause is that people do not understand it. So I hope that in my book, after reading my book, you will have some insight about flying and you will no longer feel flying. Okay, throughout my 13 year career with AirAsia, I have got some questions from the public, from my passengers, from my friends regarding flying. And I noticed that they all have got misconceptions. And these misconceptions have the possibility or potential to lead to dangers in flight. In my book, there are 17 of them. Uh, they are just too much for me to go through them one by one now. I'm going to list four of them now here. Delays. Delays. Weather, the air traffic control requirements, 
to traffic congestions or even to the pilots. Actually, that's not true. In my 13 year career, that happened very, very rarely. Most common delay reason that happens on a daily basis is again, I said passengers. Have you heard of this announcement before? Passenger EBC, please proceed to day one, we made the boarding. We hear that all the time. It's the reason is because 10 minutes before the departure time, and yet the passenger somehow fails to show up himself at the departure gate. And for safety and security reason, we have got no choice to offload, offload his luggage from the cargo compartment. And this is very, very time consuming. Hence the delays. Uh, this could be due to uh, their visa not being valid. It could be due to their uh, documents not being in proper order. So every time you fly, please make sure that your documents are in order. Okay, uh, the first question that I get most of the time when I tell people that I'm a pilot, you fly, uh, where do you fly to? Actually, we fly to all Asia destinations. We don't fly fixed roads. Uh, there's a common misconception that uh, junior pilots fly domestically and senior pilots fly internationally. That's completely not true. Uh, the only difference that it makes between an international flight and domestic flight is only passport. You need to carry a passport for uh, international flight, for domestic flight. You do need to carry a passport, but you no longer need to create immigration. And that is the only difference. But it is way, it's about cost. All the time, it is about cost saving. So if, I, if you limit your pilots to fly domestic and the other to fly international, you will have to hire a lot more pilots. It's not cost conscious. International, uh, many of them have got this misconception whereby they think from KL, flight from KL to, for example, Macau, which takes about three hours and 50 minutes, about four hours, it's more challenging than a flight to Kota Baru, a flight to Ringano, for example. It is again the complete opposite. The flight to Kota Baru is more challenging than a flight to Hong Kong. The reason being, again, the flight consists of taxi, takeoff, climb, cruise, approach, descent, landing. The same thing again goes to an international flight. So if I give you one hour to complete all these things, it is actually more time, uh, more challenging. And it's not so popular airports or wherever the traffic is not, it's not a lot. The uh, facilities or the uh, equipment would not be up to international standards sometimes. I'll give you one example, Anakan Airport, for example. Anakan Airport is one of the most challenging airport in our order destination network. Before the construction work, the runway length of Sandakan Airport was less than half of the runway length of Kuala Lumpur International Airport. So it, is a, it has a potential for us overrun the runway if you do not touch down on the exact touchdown zone of the runway. Again, it is less than half runway length of Kuala Lumpur. So which one is more challenging? Definitely, Sinagang. International airports such as Hong Kong, they have got two runways and both runways are very long. they have got a very uh, standard instruments as well. Moving on to number four, one question. Yes, yes, please. Because, uh, you know, you mentioned about Hong Kong runway, right? But there was an accident there, right? Huh? There was an accident in that runway. You mean Hong Kong? Yeah. Do you remember? I can't recall. Which airline was that? Okay. Sorry, it's not. No problem. Save a question for the last part. Yeah. Okay, the most common in flight emergency that I've encountered in my 13 year career is in flight medical emergency. I've got there a couple of times already, almost a dozen times. Most of the time, it is the passenger who had difficulty in breathing. So think of it this way you all drive a car. The most common accident today is not due to technical failure of a car, it's due to the reckless driving behavior of the driver. So think of it this way. Goes to flying, 85% of all accidents and incidents were actually caused by human errors, not by technical failure. So, next time we go to on board a flight of plane, not concerned about technical failure. 
At the same time, I'm also an investment advisor. I earned my financial investment advisor license in year 2018. And I started uh, advising my clients on how to build wealth and achieve their financial goals. And the various investment and financial vehicles that we can use to achieve that. Stocks, bonds, futures, options, commodities, real estate, REITs, and currencies. Again, I'm not going to touch all of them today as it is very time consuming. And I would like to take this opportunity to push Busan Malaysia to consider taking options on the trading platform. As an investment advisor, I advise my clients to use options to enhance their profit margin. I myself trade options. I use options. I sell the cash secure option on the stock I already want to buy. And I use, I sell a call option on the stock I already want to sell. Enhances my profit margin. Stocks. When we think of stocks, we think of something that goes up and goes down. Actually, that's not true. Okay. We think of stock as a business. Every time I purchase a stock, I always question myself do I want to own the business if the business is selling at this price? If the business is generating, for example, 10 ringgit a year and it is selling for 10 ringgit, do I want to own it? and it is expected to generate $10 every year in the next 10 years. Do I want to own it? And every time when people invest in stocks, the time horizon seems to be very short. And then when they purchase a house, the time horizon, investment horizon tends to be very long. Therefore, most house investors make money and most stocks investors lose money because of the investment horizon. Stocks give you business ownership. You are entitled to company's earnings and you have got voting rights. Okay, a popular stock is uh, Apple, for example, from year 2012 mm -hmm. until today, 2020, it has returned a total of 551%. If your investment time is long, you will always make money if you invest in profitable and solid businesses. Meta platforms, Facebook, things that we use almost every day, the thing that you scroll in the morning and people go to bed, 412% return in 10 years. Google, 667% in 10 years. Microsoft, 720%. Amazon, close to 900%. We as pilots, we have a checklist to go through before and after we perform an action to make sure that no action is left out or missing. Venture safety. Same goes to stock investing. Every time I purchase a stock, I always go through five points of this. Understand un underlying business, do I understand it? Consistently profitable and possess wide economy mode. For example, uh, let's take Apple again. Many of you own iPhones, okay? Many of you have iPhones. Uh, iPhones can, Apple has the ability to raise its prices and all of you will continue to support it. So it has got very wide economic mode and it will not, there's a very high entry barrier as well. You will not change an Android phone simply because an Android phone is cheaper. Computer management, very obvious. And I would emphasize here, uh, the management team must have a long-term view instead of a short-term view. And their performance must not be tied to the top performance of the company. And this is very important. Think below intrinsic value. And when these four points meshed, and the last point is wait for it to trade below its intrinsic value. And only you go in and purchase a stock and you hold it for long term unless something changes. Exchange traded fund ETF. Uh, I would say this is one of the best financial innovations in the world. Exchange traded fund. What does it do? Exchange traded fund is a fund holds of stocks, commodities, or bonds. It is geographically diversified across industry sectors and across different asset classes. Some advantages of in ETF, low fee, sustainable, and suitable for long-term holding. I'll give you one example. Okay, gold. Gold is inflationary hedge. So if you want to purchase gold, you can go to Popcorn, or you can go to buy an exchange ETF, a gold ETF. And gold ETF receive the money from you and they will go on the market to purchase gold and store it for you in this wallet. So it is like a certificate for you. Every time you want to purchase gold, it might be very expensive for you if you want to buy in volume, 
you can go to buy gold ETF. And the ticker is 0888. So in uh, our KLCI index, 30 stocks of them, if you want to invest in all 30 stocks, then you have to purchase all 30 companies. But with ETF, it is with ease, you can purchase only the ETF. It is equivalent to investing in all of them. Another one is S&P 500, which is very popular. If you want to invest in a US stock market, for example, and you do not know which stock to pick, no problem. You can simply purchase an ETF that invested in uh, S&P 500, for example, the SPY. You can see the top 10 holdings of SPY. The first is Apple, which consists of 6.59%, and they hold a total of 507 companies. A simple question. Let's say if you use the dollar cost averaging strategy to invest in the S&P 500 ETF, SPY, for a period of 45 years, from 1975 until year 2019. Every year, you invested with 1,000 US dollars, a total of 45K. So how much would have the return be? Million? What else? Okay, with 45K, how much would it be after 45 years? The answer is 1.26 million. So by simply holding the ETF that invest in a broad based economy, you will always outperform most of the hedge fund managers. The key here is starting early and let the magic of compound work in your favor. And this is how most financial institutions, such as pension funds, perform. Okay, another one is uh, REITs. So real estate investment trust, Malaysian people, yeah, in particular Chinese people, they are very obsessed with real estate investment. So there are actually better real estate investments out there. For example, hotels, more shopping malls, seaports, airports. These are better cash flow generating properties. However, we are just retail investors. We don't have sufficient capital to invest in, for example, host, host shopping mall. But how do we go about it? We can actually invest in a REIT. The rate I'm going to introduce is Sunway Rate, for example. Sunway Pyramid, Sunway Resort, Sunway Putra, Sunway Medical Center, or Sunway University College are not owned by Sunway Group, they're owned by this Sunway Rate. So if you purchase this Sunway Rate, it's equivalent to diversify your investment, your property investments into these 18 properties managed by Sunway Group. And I've got some advantages high dividend yield, very suitable for pensioners and very suitable for passive investors and they're probably diversified only small capital required required compared to purchasing a house yourself on 13f okay this is about uh we have got this requirement by the securities and exchange commission in the us for any fund manager or financial institution that holds uh, access that is about 100 million US dollars, they are required by regulation to file an off at form report. Doing that, we can study how financial institutions and their fund managers invest. Some prominent and legendary hedge fund managers, and these are the four investors that I follow very closely. Because they do not trade and invest. Therefore, they do not always have transactions in their portfolio. The first is Warren Buffett, Annie Drunker Mueller, Lee Lu, and Charlie Munger. Let's look at the portfolio. So this is Warren Buffett's portfolio. You can see number one holding of the company is Apple, 42%, Bank of America, followed by American Express. And this is uh, Drunker Mueller, Kumpang, and Microsoft, Himalaya by Lilu, Micron, and America. And this Charlie Munger. You notice something here? Can you see something here? You see all of them, portfolio is not fully diversified. They are very concentrated. Look at them. Uh, you see, number one holding consists of 44% of 
of the total portfolio. Number two is 36%. Altogether, account for 80% of the portfolio. I do not suggest investors to diversify too much as they will trade or avoid your investment returns. I could buy Warren Buffett. Diversification is a protection against ignorance and it makes very good sense for those who know what they're doing. For me personally, I've got only two stocks in my investment portfolio, only two stocks, and I watch them very closely. Again, my own words, put your eggs in one basket and watch it closely instead of diversifying all cross sectors and do not know what you are doing. I am very bullish on emerging markets. I use my advantage as an airline pilot to visit across many continents. And I have come to this conclusion that I can see the exponential growth in Asia, especially in these four countries. China, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Let's talk about Vietnam. Uh, I last flew to Vietnam uh, last week, Hanoi, and also Ho Chi Minh. This coming uh, Friday, I'm flying to Saigon, which is Ho Chi Minh City. Okay, every time I fly to Ho Chi Minh, every time I fly to Hanoi, I could see the people, I could see the skyscrapers, I could see the infrastructure. It changed almost every single day. No longer the same. First year, I flew to Hanoi, and now I fly to Hanoi, they are totally different. That can be reflected by the stock market performance. Year 2019, I believe, uh, the stock market performance of Vietnam, I think, increased by 100%. So look at history. A thousand years ago, China and India accounted for almost 8% of the GDP, of the global GDP. And I would be no surprise, I would not be no surprise if they recaptured the status of being the world's largest and second largest economies. So this is a study by Standard Chartered Bank. In year 2003, expected to grow to number one and number two respectively. This is by PPP. PPP stands for replacing power parity. I mean, it is a better way to measure an economy and the nominal GDP. Why do I say that? For example, PPP stands for gross domestic product, uh, measuring the total economic activity in terms of goods and services produced in economy in 12 month period. But in currency, if you can manipulate the currency, you can manipulate the GDP. Uh, one example is Japan. We now know that Japanese yen has declined by 5% against the US dollar. So if the Japanese economy declined by 5%, not really, because it is better in US dollar. Purchasing power wise, China has already overtaken the US as the world's largest economy. Reason, huge populations will be equal to large middle class. Again, this is about, all economies are about the rise of the middle class. We do not count on the rich and we do not count on the poor to provide any economic growth. Large middle class, greater productivity, and that leads to higher disposable income. When people have more disposable income, they spend and they invest. It is the spending and investing habits of the middle class that power and propel economic growth. Futures contracts. Mm, many Malaysian investors have no idea what a future contract is. Future contract is a contract that gives you the right, not the obligation, to purchase something in the future or something locked in the price. Okay. Uh, for example, if you go to a wet market and you can buy eggs, eggs prices are determined in the wet market. If you want to buy stock, you go to the stock market. Stocks prices are priced or determined in the stock market. The prices of wheat, the prices of corn, the prices of gold they are all determined in the futures contract market. How does a future contract market work? Okay, oil futures, for example. Okay, in, we are an airline. We sell you tickets in advance. And for example, this is your uh, August. You, have made, you might have already purchased a ticket for next year. Okay, but we do not know what the future oil prices will be. So how do we hedge against higher oil prices for an airline perspective? We go into the futures market and we execute some long positions. So in case in the future next year, for example, 2023, oil prices rise, we'll make less money from our airline operation 
but we make money from our long oil futures contracts. Therefore, it kind of offset our uh, airline operation. So again, we do not do that for profit. We do that to hedge against our cost. Same goes to an oil producer, for example, GP. But for example, price, oil price now is about hundred dollars, hundred US dollars per barrel. So the next now about ninety six. So current price is very profitable for my business. So how do I know that in the future the oil prices will continue to be this high? I will go into the futures market to hedge against my futures sales. I will go into the market to sell some contracts. So in the future, if the oil prices goes down, I still have the ability to sell oil at this lock in price. It goes to crude palm oil. Uh, in Malaysia, we have a uh, crude palm oil futures. Shampoo maker is the buyer. On the other hand, it is the palm oil farmer. For every transaction to be complete, there must be a buyer and a seller. Is there something we can know about the futures market? It's like the FDF report. Yes, there is. There's something called Commitment of Traders Report, COT report. It shows the futures holding of commercials, large speculators, and small speculators. Three categories of investors. So I would say traders. It's published weekly. Let's look at the wheat futures. Wheat, for example. The red line represents the commercials. Commercials are, for example, wheat, wheat producers, wheat farmers, and also wheat companies that use a lot of wheat. For example, I would say Gardenia or Nestle. Okay, blue line represents large speculators like uh, hedge funds and financial institutions. The green line represents small speculators like us, material investors. Every time when you see the red line is high, it means it is the time to buy. When the red line is low, it means commercials are selling and it is time to exit the market. Commercials are the smart money. Always follow the smart money in futures contracts markets. Then goes to soybean meal futures. As you can see, when the red line is negative, it's very low, often the price is very high. And when the red line is very high, it is time to enter the market. Again, this is all free of charge easily accessible on the internet. I, why do we need to invest? The reason being our life expectancy is ever getting longer and longer. We are living longer and longer now. We do better medicine, better technologies, and better health consciousness. News for you is that your retirement savings may outlast you. So it is very sad if you do not have enough sufficient capital or enough savings for you to cover your whole retirement years. In Malaysia today, average life expectancy of a male is about 64, female is about 68, and in 1960, he was only 60 years old. So in my generation, I would say my generation of people can live until 80, maybe past 90. Look at our Tun Mahathir today, he's 90 plus. So it will be no surprise for you to exit 100 years of age. The problem is, can your savings outlast you if you don't invest? Can you count on your children? What distinguishes an investor from a trader and speculator is the mindset. Okay, an investor invests for long term. Trader, a trader doesn't care about the fundamental of the company, and a speculator only cares about uh, news. Short term, stock prices are driven by news and investor sentiments. But long term, they are all driven by company earnings. I would suggest, I would strongly encourage people to invest for the long term. But short term, uh, it is very hard for every investor to make money. For trader, for example, I've done that many times and I lost money. And with my own experience, I would say that short term trading is not for it's not for the investor. It's for fund managers. It is for financial institutions and they have got super competitors to execute the trade for them. What makes you think that you can outperform them? Very highly unlikely. If you invest for long-term in a base index ETF, for example, the chances of you outperforming a hedge fund manager are very high. And investing should be more like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. It is supposed to be a boring process. 
if you want excitement, go to simply go to a casino. Therefore, I do not watch stock prices every day. Every time I execute a purchase order, I know I'm going to make money. It just depends on the time. Oh yeah, in my book, uh, my book consists of three parts. First part is into the cockpit. I talk about how to be a pilot and my own experiences being a pilot for 13 years. The second part written by uh, my co author C. Pong Puisi, inside the cabin. Uh, she was a cabin crew with Asia. Then she moved on to Asia X and she joined uh, Singapore Airlines as a cabin crew. Then she came back to Asia as a um, uh, cabin crew instructor. And she's now a cabin crew manager with Asia. And part three is inside the trading room, my own trading experiences and my own investing experiences. And I will discuss about uh, various financial and investment vehicles in the book as well. The book talks about uh, traffic incidents and how they happened, most importantly, and why they happened. Misconceptions about flying, aviation safety, and my time-tested investment strategy. And my outlook on various economies, such as Vietnam, Indonesia, ASEAN countries in particular, China and India. Because these are the countries that I fly to, I can witness their growth firsthand. So I can say that these countries have got very bright futures. My book retail price is 39 ringgit 90 cent. If you purchase online today, it's on discount, only selling for 29 ringgit 90 cent, only for today. Okay, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Do you have any questions? Please raise your hand or please send me a message if you have any questions. Thank you, Kokin, for your insightful uh, uh, tips and sharing about uh, flying and investing. I hope uh, after you have listened to Kokkin spoke about his experience, uh, hopefully more people, uh, you, you are encouraged to, to fly more often and uh, invest in the various uh, asset classes that he has shared. So if you have any questions, uh, you can put in on the chat box if you have logged in virtually. you have a question you asked about okay what was your question ah oh, okay okay yes. please uh, hi good afternoon to you uh, I have two questions. Okay. my question is why does uh why why we have in why, why can we carry our power bank to the aircraft? We cannot check in the power bank in the cargo. That's question number one. Okay. Question number two How come we need to offload the passengers back when they don't appear at the aircraft at the time of departure? Excellent question. Good question. Okay, okay, question number one sorry, your uh, power bank. Uh, because when the power bank is loaded into the cargo compartment, we have got no sight. It is out of our sight. So if it catches on fire, we will not know it. If we carry the luggage, yes, we do know if it's on fire. And it has happened many times on my flights. Okay. And question number two, um, about security, okay? Uh, when the passenger feels the job at the departure time, we have to, according to the procedure, we have to offload their luggage. It's because it might carry, knows that the passenger might carry a bone. So, for safety reasons, we have no choice for the offload this luggage. Yes. I would say, uh, just a kick. Just a kick. Yeah. And this has, has happened many times in our airline. Okay, we have one question here virtually from Mr. Hin Lim. His question is, when is the best time to trade option? Again, uh, I'm a value investor. I am not a trader. I, you know, I use options mainly to enhance my profit margin. For example, I sell a cash option 
on the stock are eligible to sell. Not on the buy, sorry. By selling the put option on the stock, I am able to buy the stock before or at the expiry date at this predetermined price. I receive a premium in exchange for that. So my cost of the investment is lower. Alternatively, I will sell the option on the stock I really want to sell at a higher price, for example. At the meantime, I will receive a premium. So every time I want to dispose of a stock, I will come to the market and sell a option. So no matter where the price of the stock goes, I will still have the right to sell the stock at a predetermined price. And I also receive a premium from that. It enhances my profit uh, For stock trading, for options trading, I, I do not encourage because I don't have the knowledge. Thanks, Kokin, for the answer. So, Hin Lim, hope that uh, Kokin is uh, uh, able to address uh, your concern. What is the best time to trade option? Okay, our next question is from Jenny. Jenny asked, what are your thoughts on Boeing air crashes that happened in 2019 and 2020? Uh, man, uh, 737 MAX. Yeah, Boeing Air Max crashes, okay. correct. Okay, this is about competition, okay? For competition about Airbus and Boeing, I'm not a technical expert, so I'm in no position to comment on that. This is my based on my personal opinion, okay? Airbus and Boeing, they are very they are competitors in the aviation world. Airbus came up with this new aircraft called Airbus 320 New. No stands for new engine operation. It is more cost saving, fuel saving, and it's more uh, reliable also. So it is a narrow body aircraft, just like our like our air, air aircraft. It is a narrow body aircraft. We fly Airbus A320 Neo. So the narrow body section, the narrow body aircraft from Boeing is 737. So they are lose, they were losing sales to Airbus on the Airbus 320. So in response to that, in reaction to that to compete against Airbus, they came up with this strategy to introduce MAX, 737 MAX compete against Airbus 320. But somehow, some failure in the introduction of the, uh, uh, because the engines were more powerful, so it would cause a short moment during takeoff and climb. So the Airbus, or oh, sorry, the Boeing nation introduced engineers, introduced a system to make the aircraft to pitch down after takeoff, to count the pitch up moment. And it was not made known to the pilot. The pilots had no idea the aircraft would actually pitch down after takeoff. Therefore, they resisted the pitch down movement and hence crashed the aircraft. It was due to uh, system error. I, I would say this is a very unproductive competition. Thanks, Kokin. Sounds a little bit technical to me, but then... <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next question also from Mr. Hin Lim. Okay, uh, he asks, uh, can we just turn phone to flight mode during takeoff and landing instead of turning it off? Okay. Procedure is there for reason, okay? Anytime we ask you to switch off your phones, it is because something had happened before. Therefore, the aviation industry decided to come up with this procedure. So no, please turn off your phones. Okay. All the procedures that you see in aviation is because something happened before. Therefore, after investigation, they reveal that uh, it is actually better to have this procedure in place. Therefore, you see the procedures. Okay. Thanks, Kokin. But uh, can uh, I have a question? Can we ask? Uh, can the air crew actually instruct the passenger to, you know, off their phone if they find that they? They are, you know, using their phone. Can they instruct them to off it? Or uh, they I would not say yeah. that the pilots would instruct them. I would say the cabin crew would, in a polite way, tell them. They usually go around and check and But some stubborn, you know, passengers, uh, yeah, they yeah. may refuse, you know, they, yeah, yeah okay. they're reluctant. So, you will leave them alone or you, uh, how would you? In the cockpit, I would not know about it. There will be no 
I will not oh, know about it okay. unless the passengers or unless the cabin crew tells me about it. Or unless I see some uh, interference in my navigation equipment, I will know. Okay, thanks. So it's best to just uh, make sure that you turn your phone off during takeoff and landing. Yeah, it just takes about 10 yeah. minutes. Why can't you do that? Yeah. So we have a question from Diana Rosadi. Uh, he, she asked, uh, which one gives you more passion and satisfaction? Be a pilot or be an investor? I will say both. Okay. <laughs> I will say both. Every time I see that, uh, every time I successfully reward about the disaster, I will feel happy. Every time I make profits for my clients, I also feel happy. I will say both. Thank you. Okay, question from Jenny. At the start of your presentation, you requested the passenger not to change seat, but the seats are chosen by the passenger when they check in. If the passenger chose the seats, how will the aircraft balance maintain if they themselves choose the seats? Okay, uh, this question is also very, uh, I would say very brilliant, brilliant question. Uh, yes, you can choose your seats before, when you purchase a ticket, yes. Uh, for an extra fee, okay. Uh, but uh, when the CG, when a large amount of passengers uh, swap their seats, when the, when the flight is full, okay, when the flight is full, uh, it doesn't make any e effect at all when you swap your seats because the flight is already full. But if the flight is light, for example, light light load, if you swap your seats only to the from the forward to the aft or from up to the forward, then it might cause a significant shift in central gravity. If the flight is full, then it's not a concern. Thanks for Kim for explaining that. Mm. So is best. Uh, so when we, that means to say, once we have chose the seat, we just leave it uh, in yeah. the hands of the, right. the, the, right. the airline. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, questions and answers. Uh, do you have any more questions uh, from the physical audience at the theatre? Yes. yes, we have one question. <laughs> Copy. Copy. Okay, the question uh, for the benefit of the online uh, uh, audience, uh, we have a question here. The question is, which is the best seat uh, in, in an aircraft? So my answer is the cockpit. <laughs> Any more questions? Any more questions? Okay, if you do not have any more questions, uh, we will close a uh, cocking session today. Uh, if anyone of you are interested to buy Cockin's book, okay, the retail price of his book is 39 ringgit 90 cents if you buy uh, online via Shopee or Lazada. But today, if you purchase the book, it's 29 ringgit and 90 cents. So it's 10 ringgit cheaper. So for those uh, audience who have logged in online, uh, you can just drop us an email to our knowledge center at brusamalaysia.com if you are interested to buy a copy of Cockin's book. For those physical audience or to Brusa Malaysia employees, uh, you can actually purchase the book here. We are at the theatre and uh, book uh, receipts will be issued on the spot. You can either pay by cash or even using your touch and go e-wallet. Okay, so um, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for your participation uh, attendance today. Uh, we hope after you have listened to Cockin's talk, uh, some of your doubts about flying, uh, you will, uh, you know, will perish, and you will continue to to uh, you know fly. Uh, encourage you to fly and invest in the uh, various financial products, various uh, financial asset classes that uh, Cockin has shared with you earlier. So thank you very much and uh, to tune in to our next uh, edition next month, our auto stock series. Thank you and wish you all a pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you.